on this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast, golems are cool. Nazi magicians are boring. Let's do this. episode of devil's trap podcast i'm diana and i'm liz and this week we're going to talk about season eight episode 13 everybody hates hitler fat facts Facts. what's up diana i celebrated my birthday um yeah so now i've been having some fun times and eating Lots of pastries. It's also what I argue is the best um, candy season of the year. I I stand by Easter has the best candy. I I stand by this. They got the Cadbury eggs. You've got the Reese's eggs. You've got Peeps. And I'm a Peep fanatic. We all know this. And then you've got the the, uh, Robin's eggs and the multi milk. I'm I'm, I'm fucking sold. Easter candy is the best candy out of all the candies for the holidays. Alan candy wins. So between... (laughs) Huh? Halloween candy is better. We all know it. Well, Halloween candy is just regular candy. It's just small, and you just get lots of it. So it's it not really like special. Always. Like it's like some of the candy is special. That's where you know you know, and you can get the peanut butter chocolate thing, which is the only thing that matters. And you can get those in Halloween and on Easter time. So whatever. I guess I I still think, but I'm but I also I'm a Peeps fanatic and kind of a Peeps purist. Will I eat other seasons of Peeps? Yes, because I like Peeps. Are they as good as traditional peeps? No, I want the fucking little birdie. That's a little swirly guy. Ooh, I like him. He's so the best. Sugar. Oh, oh, oh. There's no sorry. flavor. I like it. I tried to make the Rice Krispie treats out of them, though, and it was a fail. One of the recipes I found it did not come out good. Whop, whop. Nobody wants a gummy Rice Krispie. Ugh. No. But yeah, so now I had a good time and I've had... Um, Lots of lots of sweets and treats, and uh, <laughs> I guess that's it. Yeah, it's exciting, though. I mean, it's good. It's not a complaint. It's just, yeah. Yeah, that's what I got going on. How about you? I just got back from traveling to the capital of the United States, and uh, I yelled at a building. That was, that was fun. Uh, mainly, I think I was yelling at people inside the building, but you know. And then I went to the building next door and got to be a cool ass researcher at the Library of Congress, which makes me feel all badass and special that I have now elevated my status to the point where I am just in the rare reading books room of Library of Congress, looking legitly at stuff and have a reason to do that. And that's pretty cool. Uh, Library of Congress is beautiful, and it'll come up in this episode. But it is. It is a lovely place and it's a nice place to to, to spend an afternoon. It's also really cool to go basically be backstage or like a rock star. It's like the VIP pass, right? Like you walk past all the tourists. So they're like, no, no, I don't use Dan Line. I'm a researcher. Nice. And you get your own special little card. Anybody can get them. And frankly, tourists, like it's fucking annoying. I had to wait in line to get my fucking card. All of y'all think it's pretty funny. Like, I'm going to Labor of Congress and get my reading card. I'm like, some of us actually needed that reading fucking card to do shit. But there's just like be a time for like fake ass reading cards. Like, do you actually not plan to use this? Or like, I just have a window where they go do that. But uh, it was great. It was. I was in the Houdini collection because Houdini collected a lot of things on spiritualism because he was like to disprove that ghosts were real and all that other fun stuff. So his library collection was awesome and it was donated to Library of Congress. So I spent a lot of time digging through that, looking for threads and ate a bunch of good food because DC does have good restaurants. So that was really good Mm -hmm. and spent some time. I fucked around a couple of museums, but the museums are full of children because it was spring break. So, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a good week. But now it's here and we're preparing for the eclipse. The eclipse. I'm it's not, a big deal. Yeah. I'm not to be, sure. Just to be clear, if so, if you're not 
Uh, that's what I don't understand. Like, if you're not in Texas, in Bain, you may not be getting the warnings that we are. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, I mean, and there's other parts of the country because it does cut across. But um, near you and me both are on the path of totality, uh, which is a big fucking deal to have a solar eclipse for four solid minutes in your hometown. And I didn't realize what a tourist event this is. Did you know that before this? I have a friend who is coming in from California for it. So, yes. Oh, I know. But before this, did you know that it was like, before your friend booked their trip, did you know that this was like a thing people like travel for? Well, yeah, because people traveled for the last eclipse. And that wasn't even as big of a deal as this. And so, I don't know. We, but. I just didn't notice. But there are towns here like that are declaring like national disasters. Like, you know, like everyone's like i did last night though take a moment to be like there was a thread on next door and i was like let's just grab some popcorn and see how racist this is gonna get because you know people because it's next door it doesn't matter what it talks about it always just ends up somehow dissolving into a i don't even know how that it's just how next door works it's just how it is it just always dissolved in someone making a racist comment and it did so i mean somehow it got to be about border security (laughs) Thank you, next door. I know. I is the that is the beauty of next door. Anything can dissolve into a ridiculous fight. So, uh, but well, we. I am going to the winery. Yeah, people traveling. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That's exciting for you. Yeah, I'm going, going to, to the, the winery, winery, which is a winery that is there for the conservation of rhinos. I don't know. There's a rhinoceros there. Money is going to charity, which made me feel better because every place is charging like a dumb amount of money. It's stupid. And since I it's had insane. someone coming in, like I felt like I had to do something. So this was like the most reasonable amount of money to, for like a ridiculous thing. Like, I feel like I'm getting a good return on investment. I just don't know how, like... There's wine involved. There's wine involved. I just don't know how long it's going to take us to get there and back. I am terrified of getting to the hill country and coming back. Just because I know those You know, they're, like, closing schools. Like, many school districts are shutting down. Others are just giving the kids classes and telling them to watch. I don't know. Whatever. I decided, I was like, it's just a process with me. Like, I'm... Maybe I'm an asshole, but I realized at my work, I'm like, that's a fucking Monday. We're working, bitches. This is four minutes long. I'll buy you lunch and some glasses. And Capitalism doesn't stop for the eclipse. <laughs> but I'm also like, we're like, most of us are like grown up. Yes. Like, what are you? But also, you can take like, a vacation day. Oh, they could take the day off if they want to. That's fine. I'm just not going to close things down for it because the rest of the country that we're interacting with in our emails all day are probably not closed. Yeah. Well, until the lizard people come down during the eclipse and devour the earth. And That's then true. they won't be working. Or, or it's some Y2K shit and we all fall apart. Well, well like, what, like, how much of an asshole are you going to feel like if you're working and, like, the world explodes? Oh, man. At least I'll be with the rhinoceros. Yeah. Anyway, so that's coming up. I told them to bring their families. Yeah, uh, that's nice, yeah. then, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm just really concerned about their loved ones. I'm just concerned about traffic at work. because the places we're going oh. are not meant for this many people, and that's what everyone's concerned about. That is, it's that's really what it is. It's not really. They're worried that that cell towers are going to get overwhelmed. They're worried about roads getting overwhelmed, and and just people getting like like cars breaking down because of being stuck in traffic. That kind of shit. That's what the fear is, and it's a legitimate fear. You know, like I am legitimately fearing that I'm gonna be stuck in a cyber truck for the rest of my life. I'm going in a cyber truck. <laughs> I forgot you're taking a cyber truck. That's right. Uh, I'm like, I'm just like, no, no, I don't want to die in a douche mobile. Uh, so other can't things- you like shoot an arrow at it? Isn't that a thing they've done? Like shoot stuff at it. I don't know. Can you do that? I mean, sure. I don't think my friend will like it if I start shooting shit in a sudden new cyber truck, but whatever. I'm sure he's got insurance. Uh, all right. So moving on, moving on. Um, just some other news. Uh, Walker season four is returning uh, after it will be the night before we, we drop this. So that's Wednesday, April 3rd uh, with the quiet. So that's coming back. Also, it's really tragic and sad news. Chance for Domo. He played Andre Anderson in the boys, the boys spinoff Gen V. He was also uh, in, in Adventures of Sabrina, uh, her really hot cousin. I don't know if it was the character, but he, it was Sabrina's really hot cousin. He was a bi guy who lived in the house. And then, anyways, uh, unfortunately, oh, he yeah. yeah he died in a motorcycle accident this week. 
Awesome. Yeah, and cast for uh, season two is just as far, about to start filming on Gen V, and so they have pushed that off indefinitely. I'm not sure what they're going to do with that show, but it just was tragic. He was just he was a really good actor, and you know I want to objectify someone like me. It's just Trevor Checker, but you know he was just I very much enjoyed watching him. You know, and this is a yeah. bummer. I don't know what's going to do for the show, but bummer all around and such you know as is nazi magicians nazi magicians are just a bummer and last night i hung out the phone with diana and i was like did you watch the episode yet and she said yes why and i was like because i was about to tell you i'm gonna go watch i had to go dive back into nazi magicians which she said i wouldn't be surprised if i hadn't seen the episode if i hadn't watched the show yeah. i would have not been shocked by that yeah so this was season eight's episode 13 it first aired february 6 2013 and was directed by phil scuccia and written by ben edland so heavy hitter is here for this one which is a pretty it's a pretty you know it was a big episode in terms of lore but just a a lot happens in this episode yeah. So, and we're going to just dive right in. And our recap is just men of letters, men of letters, men of letters. Very men of letters. Mm. Yeah. And I cannot pronounce the name of this city in Belarus. Uh, Vitsyvex. And right. so this is really something I think is really important to know. This is a real town. And during World War II, when this is happening, Nazis were occupying this town. Right. And right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm going I'm to start off telling you this. I want, I want you guys to remember this when we get to the part about the fool. So this town used to have a pretty big, large popu Jewish population. Um, there used to be like basically it was like half the town, but Nazis came in and half the people either you know, fled, were, half of them thankfully fled, but uh, the other half or basically Nazis ended up operating a prison there and there's forced labor camps and everybody was murdered. So when we start in this Belarus 1944 and the guy goes, I'm late because it was a shoemaker's daughter. That's not really funny. <laughs> because mm -mm. this town I, yeah so i'm gonna let you come to your own conclusion about that as belarus was under nazi occupations so but then well, especially when the other guy's comment response to him immediately was something about getting the clap like trying to clap so yeah, yeah. it was gross but then we get some satisfying moments of violence no we do we do one of them's trying to light a cigarette and then some large figure approaches him and throws him through the fucking guard shack yeah so, um, yeah. And so there's like this fight at, at, with some large person creature outside of the guard shack, but inside the building that they're guarding, yeah, we've got some like Nazi officer pouring, like has a jar of blood. And then we got another one making notes from a, in a ledger from, um, some radio calls. Yep. Uh, yeah, and so you like lots of books, lots of Nazis, a radio operator just yelling, it won't go down, it won't go down, story of my next 60. And so. <laughs> and whatever is coming after them, they are all queued up to shoot the shit out of while well, this officer, Nazi officer, is doing a fucking blood ritual. Yeah, he's and... doing some magic. And the yeah. thing is, like, they're like, one, you can really tell, like, he's Nazi because he starts damning the sorcerers of abraham and if that's not some anti-semitic bullshit i don't know what is so uh he lights something on fire and that ignites a cloaking flame and then the giant man comes in and he just rips apart nazis yeah, the giant man this is just a big big man a little andre the giant fish. that's what i was kind of thinking i was trying to think of the best way to compare him to and i think very andre the giant like i just I because it's not like him yeah, because it's not like or, you know, or the rock human size. Like I also, there, it's just yeah, there was times where I large. thought he was rockish, like Dwayne Johnson. Maybe Dwayne, yeah, maybe I went Andre because I think also just the the, the angular face, which Ooh. is associated with with some of the uh, yeah. size sometimes. But either way, it was very just a very 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 large man who was not bothered by a bunch of bullets nope. at all. Nope, and. uh 
And so there we go. That's our intro scene. Yep. And, you know, he just goes inside and the commander yells at him to tell your masters, it's not over. And then everything goes up in flames in a very cool effect. So we this very epic opening to this, right? We're just like Nazis getting ripped apart. I can see that over and over again. And then just flames, flames. But in Lebanon, Kansas, in modern times, Sam and Dean have pulled up at this abandoned, what appears to be an abandoned factory with a door in the hill below it. And they figured out that no one's been here in 60 to 70, 65 to 70 years. This is the location that the man of the men of letters gave them to to go to. Yes, it That's is a there. coordinates that match the key for the supernatural mother load. So we're about to yeah. see what is waiting for them in the supernatural, natural, super mattress, super mattress. <laughs> supernatural mother. Luke. And as they discover when they go inside, it's the fucking bat cave. And it's very deco. Like I know this like was supposed to be forties, but it's so gorgeous. Everything is just gorgeous. And there's a ham radio and a telegraph and a switchboard. And so many books. 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 And apparently there's a shower and some left behind robes and slippers too. Cause Dean goes and immediately takes a shower. Yeah. And so there's also a generator that works and Dean is just really impressed with the water pressure. Cause it's important. And it Sam just wants to acknowledge that this place is weird. And we're just, you know, dead Dean's just like, we're not going to talk about the fact that we don't know how this power started. We're just going to pretend like this is all just awesome yeah. stuff. Yeah, and he's like, look, he, but he also doesn't want Sam to get all like hoity toity, like the men of letters, like they knew something that the hunters don't. But Sam's like, no, I think that they do, they might. This could help us, and this could help all of society catch a break in all this shit that we're dealing with all the time. So I'm going to research the fuck out of everything and see what they knew. But Dean's not wrong because Sam points out, you know, when he's like, you know, they're a secret society, and Dean volleys back with, that means they made stuff up. And that's accurate. Like the more time I spend researching secrets, you know, I have yet to find a secret society that just didn't make shit up. And Dean also says that they were fezzes and sashes and swung scimitars around like it was a bad thing. Like, how is that a bad thing? That's what I want to do. If I could have a fez and a sash on right now and be swinging a sword, damn well know I'd be doing it. Also, Dean's dead guy robe has initials T-E-P embroidered in red on the left breast pocket. And according to Ben Edlin, this is a shout out to Tyrone Edmund Power, who was an American actor from the 1930s to 50s. Edlin said, a better swordsman than most, a wartime pilot, had a heart attack while shooting a duel in Spain. Definitely man of letters. Hmm. Over in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, we have an older Jewish gentlemen enter the library and the librarian obviously knows him and says that he's late. And the man's talking about how he had to change bus lines because he was being followed. It just sounds super weird. And you can tell the librarian does not really believe him. And, uh, but the, he, he, uh, you know, gets the, the manuscript that the, that the Jewish man has asked for. It's um, from an estate and um so it's from an estate but it's more importantly it's from an uncatalogued collection and so this is like like a researcher's dream it's just a box full of crap that you don't know what's in there like you think it could be something and now you're going through and finding it and so he finds a ledger and then he says a word that i'm not gonna repeat because i would just mess it up and it's yiddish for dear god and it is the ledger, the this burned up book from Belarus, where we saw at the beginning the beginning scene. It's this ledger that was being written in at the time. Um, and so he's trying to explain to the librarian that this is like super special and has to be protected. And the librarian's like, yeah, sure, of course it will be because it's safe here in the fucking library, dum dum. It's basically the librarian's at librarian's attitude. Yeah, he's a dick. So, but also <laughs> But um, anyway, so the and the old, old man gets a little sassy with him, which is good. I appreciate it when he basically tells him that, you know, he needs to do something about the bug up his ass. But you know. either way, so it, the old man leaves the library 
and goes straight to the campus pub and uses the payphone with a credit and somebody's card. watching him. He has a payphone yeah. that you can insert a credit card in. And I just was like, Quit. I remember that era That's briefly. Crazy. I can't even imagine, like, oh, my God, how much I could steal off of that. Anyway, so someone is watching him leave his message at the tone. And he's leaving a message about how there's no time left. He found it and gives, like, a code number to find this and and hangs up. You know shit's going weird because he leaves his notes unattended at this point. He turns away from the payphone and walks towards the window and is yelling out yelling toward the window from indoors so nobody else can hear him but towards the person following him about like why are you so shy come on in and people in the pub are looking at him and then he's yelling about a nazi piece of rubbish and then he starts smoking and i don't mean he lit up a cigarette in the bar like smoke from under his collar Mm -hmm. like his body is physically smoking and then he catches fire and he's, he's put, screaming about Nazi pigs. Yeah. And pretty much, you know, like, if I can go out yelling, you Nazi pig, like, I think my life will probably be in a good position. So, two weeks later at the bunker. So, I just like how they kind of skip through this, right? So, we have this nice, like, this is what happened in those two weeks. Dean went out to go see Kevin. He's fine. Garth is fine. And Sam is just no, working. Garth says hi. Garth says hi. And Sam is just working at these tables are so fucking awesome. And they are like, this This room really much does remind me of the reading room at Library of Congress. But just like the massive tables that you can spread out and work on. And I'm so jealous of all of this space. Yeah. And well, so this Sam is like, has- well, so I'm like, so this is what I need for like my new house. Like, do I just need to build a bunker? Or just a big research table. Just a big research room. Mm. <sighs> anyway, so That's Sam your is own yeah. library, yeah. your own library. So, but Sam has discovered something about the Judah Initiative. Well, because he yeah. has been creating a Men of Letters database, and this is like yeah. this is the Sam I love. This is hot Sam. Sam is getting all geeky, and he's making databases like where he's cross referencing the names of the people, the names of the things they did, like going through all of her stuff. It's so fucking hot. So now Sam is found. The Judah Initiative in World War II, which was made up of rabbis, and they were hardcore saboteurs. That's fun. Um, and um, he figured out that one of them is still alive. And or was. so Rabbi Bass, or was, he was still alive until two weeks ago. Rabbi Bass, he was on a college campus and spontaneously combusted. So now we know that our gentleman from the previous scene was part of the Men of Letters. No, he was not part of the Men of Letters. He was part of the Judah well, Initiative. he was part of the Judah Initiative, which worked with the Men of Letters. Yeah, they were just, like, in society, like, in, you know, in, they, they were, like, a dotted line to each other. They weren't, like, a part of each other. Right. They worked together, but they weren't the same. Yeah. Kind of. So, either way, so... It's, it would be, Gina's, like, Gina's, the CIA and MI6, but right. the secret societies. Well, Dean's drinking about it because he's annoyed about them having a case when he just got back from visiting Kevin. But he's nesting, right? So he just like has a place that he just got back to and he's sad about leaving it. That is adorable. <laughs> so Dean's nesting and Sam's making databases and Liz is swooning. I love men of letters. I love the bunker. This is my happy place. Me too. All right. So they go to Pennsylvania. Sam goes to the library. Duh. Says he's a research assistant of Rabbi Bass. And, and he is so to... nerded up. I'm just fanning myself again. He's got like a little like, he's got a little sweater vest on. <laughs> sweater, like a, sweater, with a little like, jacket. yeah, it's very, he's very nerdy and I love it. Well, he wants to see whatever the rabbi saw the day that he died. Uh, so in the meantime, Dean's going to go to the pub and talk to a couple of the girls there that were there at the pub that night. And they're like, yeah, he was a nice old kook. And basically said he talked a lot um, to himself or to anyone that would listen about a secret war with special Nazis, necromancers. Nazi Nazi necromancers. Necromancers. So, uh, and while this is all going down, some guy with a umbrella in his drink is making eyes at Dean. So, there we go. Yeah. Back at the... 
Yeah, back at the oh, library, right. yeah, Sam opens up the the tote that this manuscript was in, and also that manuscript would not have been that tote. But anyways, and instead of the manuscript, there is the Explorer's Guide to North American Birds, which looks really pretty, but not, it's bizarre. Not, not, not what he's not a legend. So Dean has to go confront this guy that's making eyes at him and flashes FBI badge. He's Agent Bolin. Yeah, so you know, so Agent Bolin, obviously that's Mark Bolin, who was T Rex. And last week I learned that Mark Bolin once got up to three hundred pounds before he died. Huh. Yeah, I didn't know that. T Rex was fat. Who knew? Well, this guy's like, Oh, I thought you were a headhunter. I was waiting for you out of your meeting. And then Dean's like, no, I've seen you a bunch today. And then the guy's like, no, I'm sorry I lied. I thought we had a magic eye moment or eye magic moment. And Dean gets very flustered when he thinks he's being hit on. Like very, very flustered. And so Dean has to like stumble away. Luckily, Sam calls. The yeah. But as he's stumbling away, he's just like, he starts calling him. I'm just doing a federal thing, citizen. And like calling people citizen. citizen. I'm going to call you citizen from now on. So Sam's like, hey, this research doesn't make sense, but I, FYI, I'm going to use a code word that to tell you that somebody's following me. It's something stuck to my shoe, and that's an old gumshoe thing. Ah, gumshoe. Dun, 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 dun. But it's an old thing that you would say when somebody was following you. Like, I've got, got gum stuck to my shoe. Um, also, I didn't Dean, know that. Yeah. You didn't know that? Say Diana word. And Dean is also, I feel like, overplaying his masculinity by commenting how hot the co eds were when he's talking to Sam. And but to be fair, in the transcript, they are named attractive young woman one and two. So I mean, I guess they had to be go. to be attractive, but I also feel like there was just like, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, super, super hot women. I do my penis yeah. is large. Uh so they agreed to meet up at the visitor's parking lot to set a trap for whoever's following sam so baby's parked and dean fumbling or sam walks up fumbling keys by himself and you can tell someone's watching from the bushes and dean sneaks up on the spy and it is our giant from belarus he is he's very very big and he gets thrown across the parking lot and then the man breaks baby's window is that through baby i thought it was through another car i don't know um so he gets thrown across the parking lot the man comes for sam and then when sam cuts him like it's weird it's like well sam gets into trunk so we do get a a brief moment of trunk's contribution here thanks trunk uh yes and then um and then he cuts into his arm with a knife he pulled out and it's like like clay yeah but you know it's also and like i can see this like you ever have those dreams where like you punch somebody and nothing happens like can you imagine this with a knife you're like what the that'd be very distressing what the hell like why won't this work and then someone says stop as as he's choking sam out and who is it but our guy from the bar that was making eyes at Dean. Bearded guy. So I call him at this point. I call him him bearded guy because I couldn't remember his name. And then he tells him that he's a golem and he's my golem. Aww. Did, did you know what a golem was? Do I have to explain that? You know, okay. I, fig- I figured that's what I didn't like. I figured everyone knew that one. So I hope. Yeah. I don't know. Look at so they go to this rental property yeah i also i'm looking at like it looks like a house and like but a it's co- got rental i feel like it's like an apartment co- like the college houses you know like near campus mm-hmm. like made for students they're just gonna fuck it up i don't know um i don't know it's a rental house ish whatever maybe that, like rabbi that... jacob uh, rabbi J- rabbi isaac had rented it well maybe well i don't know this is where aaron is staying with his yeah. solemn and he shares that Rabbi Bass was his grandfather. Um, and he started following Sam and Dean when they started investigating the rabbi's death. And no, they didn't so, have a moment. They did not have Poor a moment. Dean. He was definitely trailing Dean. Yeah. Um, but that's basically it. He's really like mocking of this golem. Like he's just kind of like, he's kind of like, likes him but just kind of talks shit and he's like yeah he's well he's shaped from clay and brought to life by the rabbi to protect the jewish people and he it was left to aaron by his grandfather so 
Right. And Sam mentions the Judah initiative though, and Golem starts talking, which shocks everybody because apparently they're not normally talking. No, they talk. Like just in this he hasn't talked. Well, they imply that they don't always. Yeah. And so the Golem isn't happy that they know about the men of Judah, but they but he backs off and they drop men of letters, right? And and then we see like super blonde dude with the glasses stalking them outside. Mm-hmm. And that's the one that stalked Rabbi. So that's not good. And he's like, look, um, Dane's like, look, Aaron, I, I know this is all new to you, but our whole family is into supernatural stuff. So surprise, surprise. Well, Catch up. Yeah. And they kind of bond over this, right? They bond over their families coming from this thing. And Aaron tells him that his family thought his grandpa was nuts until he died. And a big box showed up. And when it opened it up, it was the golem and he was naked. So how big was that box? Who delivered it? Were there stairs? How did, what how, was this a crate? Like Did you have a crowbar? Like, yeah. Was like, how, like, was it long? Was he folded up inside? Like, how did you get him in there? How did you lift this? Like, he's got to weigh like 9,000 pounds. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. And dead weight of yeah. him? Like, no. Oh, God. So, and apparently this, quote, big naked potato-faced lunatic woke up and went crazy. Because he was in a box. He was stuffed. And he trashed his entertainment, Aaron's entertainment center. Oh, but the golem is not entertained by anything Aaron has to say. He's just talking about how like undevout he is and all this kind of stuff. And I really like Aaron's immediate comment was everybody loves bacon. Yeah, he's going to keep so. kosher. And the uh, golem keeps saying something in Hebrew that means take charge. Yes. It keeps saying take charge. And Aaron just doesn't know what the fuck it means. Doesn't really listen to, like, I didn't really listen to his grandfather because nobody believed him. And he's just not prepared. Um, and he was just so insulated from everything, his, all the stories his grandfather told. And now he's, and apparently his grandfather was always talking about trying to track down the Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E, which were the Nazi necromancers. And so Sam and Dean have to explain what a necromancer is. And, um... The golem's like, yeah, that's who murdered the grandfather, and we need to find him. So he's well, and he also, yeah, and he also says that this is important for later. That Aaron says that all he knows about the Thule were that they were this twisted secret fraternity hell bent on world domination that sponsored the early days of the Nazi Party. So that's an important fact to keep in mind what Aaron thinks the Thule Society were. Just bookmark that. So. There, Sam's like, hey, wait, that that number you have written down from your grandfather, though, by the way, is a library call number. Library of Congress call number. There's a difference because otherwise it could have been a Dewey call number. And Sam knows the difference because he's a hot nerd. So the colleges, universities typically use Library of Congress as a reference system as opposed to undergrad, like a high school or elementary school would use like a Dewey Decimal System. But Sam is a hot nerd. And of course, he knows the Library of Congress call symbol and even knows this is sciences and probably books. He knows the classification system's that hot because he's hot nerd Sam. Hot nerd Sam. Even with that hair? His hair is, he's grown into his hair. Like, you can see I'm no longer combing on it. It's fine now. He's, 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 he's grown into it. It just took a while. It was awkward. I just had to check. Okay. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with nerd hair. Nerd hair is fine. Got it. Uh, so they go break into the library. Aaron comments on the fact that they broke into the fucking library. Why is there no alarm? (laughs) That's a, the Very fucking dumb. library. Like, I'm sorry. There should at least be alarm. Anyways. <laughs> well, Sam is going to run up the stairs and go find the book while Dean, Aaron, and the Golem wait for him. Uh, Sam finds it quite quickly because he knows what he's doing. He knows his call. And numbers. then swiftly gets hit with a dart in the neck. <laughs> so this is not good. Not good. But it's not just like, oh, a sleepy time dart. It's a, oh, you're going to die dart because it's like turning him like bruisey, like something bad is happening dying bad yeah and so he like it manages to shove a, a a cart into our blonde nazi dude uh blonde fool guy and um who demands the ledger and uh runs down the stairs and as he's collapsing in front of his friends he goes help necromancer and then aaron's like oh shit and then aaron gets darted too so Dean luckily tells Gollum, hey, 
they're both gonna die unless you go catch whoever did that so the golem's like fucking like after him which is cool to have a golem to do these it things. is it is but he gets and he gets darted but it doesn't matter and so he gets the the blunt <laughs> and it's just really i found this hilarious he reached through the shelves and grabs him and it's just like smashing his head through the shelves that was entertaining mm-hmm. yeah which was satisfying uh and then drags him down the stairs to dean yeah okay says, yeah long Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he drags yeah. down the stairs where he does use his last dying word, the, the fool, and he snaps his neck, right? And like, but why? Like, why did you take him down the stairs? Like, why did you just kill him up there? Why'd you wait? I don't understand either. Dean, so Dean just said you need, you're, unless you're gonna, they're both gonna die unless we catch whoever cast the spell. So here's my question. Dean never clarified that we have to kill the no. person. What if they needed information from yeah, him? And they, and the golem didn't know this. I don't know. I don't know. And did we know that Blondie pa- like fucking cast the spell, or did he just fucking shoot the dart? I don't know. This is a very like loose piece bit of the yeah, story. Yeah, you lucked out here, Dean. You lucked out yeah. for sure. So, they, but basically, so, like we know, like not us. This Nazi necromancer is dead. We later learned his name was Torval, but he did. One down. And one down. Yeah, and so they wake up. Like Aaron wakes up in the back of Baby, and he just misses Sam and Dean digging. And I know he's really sad. It's like at this point, like the grave is already done and they're just there with the body. Like he missed the best part. Poor Aaron. Yeah. And the golem tells him, he's like, Hey, those men of letters saved your life. So, but as, as a, they're burying this, this necromancer before they, you know, put gas on it and set it on fire. Um, they're discussing how to oh no mr bill over there is the comment that dean makes and basically they're saying like if if shit goes awry how do we how do we dispatch this golem it's a, it's a good discussing. question right yeah and aaron is watching uh, aaron doesn't hear their conversation but he definitely sees them pour gasoline on and burn this body and calls them psychopaths yep he's slightly so. freaked by them burning the corpse so back at this run to Aaron's house, whatever, um, Sam is using internet translators on the ledger in this log book from the Belarus compound. And um, it's disturbing. Aaron's like, the what it yeah. says is May 12th, 1944, the commandant has been formed, informed that the group one has responded favorably to the latest trials. Yeah. That's never a good thing so, to see in a ledger. Mm mm. So he, Aaron's like, this is leisure is one that my, my grandfather was convinced was lost in a fire. And Sam's like, yeah, it's describing horrible magical experience, experiments that were performed. And the golem knows about him too. He's like, yeah, it's more horrible than words. Okay, then. So uh, he realized, Sam realizes that the golem was the one that was there. Yeah, he was like, created in the ghettos of Vitsivbeks, whatever, however you guys are, in Belarus. He was in the ghettos of, of there to burn the place down. So that is where yeah. he was created. He was created by the rabbis there. And so Sam finally was like, what the fuck does this take charge mean? Yeah, and he's like, "Oh well, uh, Aaron needs to consult the pages." And and why can't, why can't Aaron, Aaron consult the pages? Dang it! <laughs> because the pages were like a really nice thin vellum, and he definitely rolled weed and didn't smoke them. I'm not saying that I have never seen, heard, or maybe on some like television show saw people in a hotel room that use a vellum of like you know the Bibles that were like in the hotel room drawers to to roll things. I mean, but that because that vellum is. I mean, I can see it. Yeah, the vellum's nice. But, um, you know. I... Here's my one comment I would say. And this is not as a disparaging comment against the Bible. But I feel like you know there's another fucking Bible. But there might not be another yeah, you know, this guy like... to golems that was a gift from your grandfather. I'm just, I'm I'm, just saying. You know, I'm saying. Yeah, no. Like, I... I... I, that's you know, probably why the Bibles are fine to smoke. Nothing, whatever. But, and, allegedly. But... This, yeah, come on, come on, man. Like, you can clearly tell this is really old. Like, it's written in Hebrew. Like, it's, this looks like some old shit. Come on. Like, even if your grandpa, even if you think your grandpa crazy, it was special to him. Yeah. Like, like I don't uh... gonna burn my grandfather's prayer book. 
Like, there's just not, right. it's just not something you do. There's a line. And also, it just looks yeah. like a rare book, you fucktard. Like, how stupid were you? So, finally, he, Aaron's pissed, though, when everybody's judging him for this and really just wants the golem to tell him what to do. And the golem doesn't like that. He's like, it's not my job to teach the teacher. And it's not my place. And he walks away. So, there we go. We find out Sam's like, yeah, by the way, the Thule were murdering Jews and gypsies and then trying to magically reanimate them to as practice so they could ma- later magically reanimate their own people. Yeah, it's fucked up. So fucked up. And in the last page is a roster of all the reanimated Thule, and they learn that they can be killed with a headshot, but it has to be, the body has to be burned with it within 12 hours or it will reanimate again. Those Nazi bastards. Gross. Yeah. Um, uh, a car pulls anyway, up. A black so car pulls we get up a black outside. car, black town car. Yeah, and this guy has this fancy ring with a symbol on it. Yeah, it's a sword and, this and four is crosses. Our yeah. commandant is what they were calling him. The Nazi officer from Belarus is there now, and he is annoyed that their blonde guy is dead, but knows, but can tell through magicy shit that he's like tasting in the air that it was not by a man because I guess he talked to the blonde guy's ghost I don't know that's basically what he says he talked to the blonde guy's he's ghost a that was forced, the ghost was to part, forced to depart he was forced to depart but he finds the residue of dirt in the library shelves and knows that it's clay so now he knows that it's a golem hmm mm-hmm. so Dean decides to make a call to Garth and while they're, while him and Sam are researching golems, cause now they're trying to figure out how the fuck they dispatch this golem if they need to. And basically it, Garth doesn't know anything about it. And no one in Garth circle has ever even heard of the fool, which is not great. Yeah, that's, but, that's not smart. Okay. So yeah, they, so they don't know what they're doing. And then Aaron comes in and basically questions their right to end and control his golem, which is fair. Like, who the fuck yeah. do you think you are, Mr. Winchester? Like, this isn't yeah. your shit. This is my responsibility. And as they're arguing about that, the front door breaks in. And it's the Nazis. And it's fucking Nazis. <sighs> We've got three very strong arm Nazis and your and our good old commandant dude is there too. And Sam, Dean, and Aaron are all pinned down with guns. The golem enters and is ready to smash but our commandant guy tells him enough and he stops no. and why does he stop it's very sad it's very sad and, and like when he like becomes like unanimated i guess that's the word like I, he just becomes so sad to me <laughs> like this is just yeah like I, I just want to hug him like and like come back come back poor golem yeah so they and and it was alluded to a little earlier. I'm sorry, we we kind of jumped past a couple of ways that you take control of a golem, are either um, writing or wiping off a na- the uh, a word from their head, or um, through a scroll in their mouth. Yeah. And those are those and, are all traditional. And so we see yes. this happen. So when he says a second he time, spits out a scroll. Yeah, and it is it is a pretty cool scroll. You know, it's so Rollum cool. spits up a scroll, but he spits it into the hand of our fucking Nazi commandant. And anyway, and we so, you know, we learned that Aaron was supposed to write his name on the scroll, and he did not yeah. know that. And then he gets bitch slapped by the command- commander. Yeah, I don't like it. So in the meantime, Dean keeps eye on opportunities to either grab a pistol or whatever, and just doesn't really get a, an ability to, or an opening to do so. Sam is telling the Nazi to screw himself when they want to find the, the, Nazi the ledger. I, I appreciate the, the lines of how about you screw yourself, you Nazi bastards. Then Dean calls him a Nazi necromancer dicks. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Nazi necromancer dicks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, anyways, so Sam actually tries to kind of distract them by like asking questions and also just shit talking and while he's doing that, unfortunately, one of the henchmen find the fucking ledger. And but also and... when Sam is doing this, he does figure out that this the commander, unlike the other Thule, he's not undead. He's immortal. And if, like, yeah, so different. that's a difference he has between the other ones. 
Yeah. And Dean's like talking shit about the blonde Nazi they killed. He's just doing, they're just shit talking. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of sweet. Uh, and, uh, anyways, he's, he, the commandant is very happy for, for finding this fucking ledger. And, um, he's just like, I'm just going to tell a joke. Uh, Jew, two Gentiles and a golem walk into the bar. It doesn't end with them coming out. But as this is happening, uh, Aaron grows some balls and picks up a big old piece of wood and whacks the fuck out of the commandant in the head like a fucking baseball. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And Sam has finally learned to make headshots. Finally in season eight. He's gotten good with his gun finally. Yeah, because this allows just enough opening for Sam and Dean to each get guns, and they both shoot this commandant guy in the head at the same time. And then another, um, you know, and one, someone, one of the, one of the Nazi thugs tries to take Aaron as a hostage, but it doesn't really work. Okay, yeah, yeah. So Either and way. so everyone but the commander is dead, right? And mm-hmm. the commander yells, "You can kill me, but you can never kill all the Thul." And yeah. yes, you can. And we're going to talk about that because it's time for lore. Yeah. <laughs> all right so yes you could kill all the fool or you could just let them fade into nothingness why because they were fucking boring and maybe that is how it should be nazis shouldn't get to have cool stuff because they are fucking nazis so in researching this i was one i was like yeah nazi magicians but of course i was disappointed because things aren't real as much as you want them to be and One thing to understand about the time period prior to World War II, you know, probably the only, starting way before that, but definitely like late 1800s up into World War II, having secret lodges in societies were all the rage because life was really boring and people like to dress up in ropes and chant things, right? And there are, if you go through the books about this stuff, it's all about this order and this order, and there was this Rudolph, and there was this Carl, and this blah blah blah, and they were in this thing, and they were and they're pretty much like they're all fucking racist. Um, in the fact that a lot of the lodges are coming down from Madame Blavatsky's theory of the- theosophy. If you don't know, Madame Blavatsky was a grifter who basically is responsible for most of the magical nonsense that exists today uh, but one of her things was about like the there are these races that humans were descended from right and depending on which which outlook you're looking at is like four to eight races but this is where that theory of Aryan race tends to come from and I a lot of them say like even like they go because Blavatsky and Theosophists are really into or I'm using their word which is or, you know, orient, orientalism being that you know eastern mysticism and stuff just seems like you know the cool things but in order to have this theory that the Aryan race was superior how can you have this eastern thing so to make that logic work they would say then that the eastern people were def- descended from the Aryans right so but basically this all the the main like racial theory is a, is that there was like specific races this is why the Aryan race was superior right they that's where the secret magic comes from and Of all the lodges that kind of went through things, the main one that precedes the Thule Society was called, oh boy, here we go. We're we're going into the German. German and Orden. Sounds good, right? German and Orden? I can say it when you say it like a Swedish chef. But so that, yeah, that was a quote unquote secret anti Semitic ethnic national based sect who based their rituals on Freemasonry because nobody can think of their own thing. So it was kind of a cross between the Maze Masonic rites and other Hermetic things, right? Because everyone's just kind of pulling from what they want. Also, at the same time, there's this thing going on in Germany. It's happening in a lot of other countries, but in Germany, it's called Volkisch. And it's this idea of basically um, how do I put this uh, f- like folk the folklore of Germany and it's creating this mythology of the German land and German people in order to create a national identity that can bind people together right so going back and being like Hans Christian Andersen folktales and all these things but they kind of went some things were going back more towards Odin worlds 
like kind of towards the Norse thing. So you read a lot of things about Thule society stealing things from the Vikings as well. Um, so, but those was kind of important things that were happening at the time that influenced what these cults were made of, right? And so the Grimond and Orden, uh, um, they had an application, and in their form, they requested details about the color of the applicant's hair, eyes and skin. The ideal coloration was blonde to dark hair, blue to light brown eyes, and pale skin. They also had further details regarding the particular matters of their parents and grandparents, and if you're married, of your spouse as well. And so to talk about a little bit what their initiation was like, so there was a summons to initiation ceremony of the Berlin province in 1914, and this was a frock coat and white tie affair, and any new candidate would have to submit to racial tasks by the Berlin phrenologist Robert Berger Villingen, who had devised the plaster meter, which was his instrument for determining how pure your Aryan race was by cranial measurement. You can't tell that's a bunch yeah, of you bullshit. Said phrenologists, and I was like, no. Oh way. yeah, that's where that's where phrenology went to, right? Phrenology was generally used either to determine if you're a criminal or like what class system you belong to. It's all it's all fucking nonsense because I can hit you on the head and create as many bumps as I want. All right, so going back a couple more years again, you're getting the idea. This was kind of around like the 1910s ish era, you know. They had a, they found like something that said what their novice initiation ritual was. And so I just want to tell you this so you could understand how stupid these people are. So while the novices awaited in an adjoining room, the brothers assembled in the serial, ceremonial room of the lodge. The master took his place at the front of the room beneath the Balodkin, flanked on either side by two knights wearing white robes and helmets adorned with horns and leading on their swords. So we got two dudes in white robes, but on top of the white robes is a helmet and there's horns and they, and they got that right. In front of these sat the treasurer and secretary wearing white Masonic sashes. So we got two sashes while the herald took up his position in the center of the room. At the back of the room, in the grove of the grail, stood the bard in a white gown. Before him, the master of ceremonies in a blue gown, while the other lodge brothers stood in a semicircle around him as far as the tables of the treasurer and secretary. Behind the move of the grail was a music room, where a harmonium and piano were accompanied by a small choir of forest elves. The ceremony began with soft harmonium music while the brothers sang the Pilgrim's Chorus from Wagner's Tannhauser. The ritual commenced in candlelight while with brothers making the swine of the swine, the sign of the swastika and the master reciprocating. Then the blindfolded novices clad in pilgrimage mantles were ushered by the master of ceremonies into the room. Here the master told them of the orders, Ario Germanic and aristocratic philosophy before the bard lit the sacred flame in the grove and the novices were divested of their mantles and blindfolds. At this point, the master seized Wotan's spirit that's what Odin is in front, and held it before him while the two knights crossed their swords upon it. A series of calls and responses accompanied by probably like, I'm a Nazi, are you a Nazi? Well, they didn't have a Nazi yet, but you know, I'm a racist, whatever. Uh, so uh, their consecration followed with cries from the forest elves as the new brothers were led into the grove of the grail around the bar of sacred flame. I'm sorry, you've got fucking forest elves. I cannot take you seriously. It like, or, like feels like the elves in disenchant- disenchantment if you've ever seen that. So, All right, so that's in 1916, the order newsletter began to display a curved arm swastika superimposed on a cross. And soon advertisements for this kind of focus jewelry, rings, pendants, and tie pins, incorporating various runes and the swastika started appearing in their order newsletter. So this is one of the hmm. things like starting to be the rise of the swastika in Germany is starting to happen around this time. And so a lot of it's con- okay. contributed back to this era. All right. At the same time, a man named Rudolf von Sepotendorf, and that's not his real name. He wasn't a baron. He gets adopted a thing, but that's just what he ends up going by. And so he becomes a member of the Germanen Orden and <laughs> he's the Berlin chief 
Herman Pohl. And Herman Pohl, like, is like, oh, hey, like, I saw in these letters, you, you know, in your advertisements, like, I had, you had all these runes. And Pohl tells him, like, we don't know what these means because of all the racial contamination, the Aryans have lost this knowledge. So once we clean this up, like, we'll be able to understand them. So it's another one of these justifications for purifying of a race, being that we can understand magic if we get rid of these parts of or, yeah, it's stupid. All right. So in 1918, hmm. the Grimanian Orden is has adopted the name of the Thule Society to cover as basically a cover for the Munich Lodge of the Grimanian Orden. So the Thule Society ends up taking rooms at the Four Seasons. And so it's a very posh hotel. So they have five rooms. It's a very posh hotel. And they had lodges there that were convoked, invoked at least once a week. And they had lectures and excursions. They, they still love the harmonium. There was a female choir. The rooms were decorated with the Thule emblem showing a long dagger superimposed on a shining swastika sunwheel. And male members of the Thule Society were called brothers, and they sported a bronze pen of a swastika and a shield cross by two spears. So, okay, swastika on a shield, crossed by two spears. And then the sisters just had a plain swastika of gold. Right. All right, 1919, Seb Ottendorf outlined the roles organizations. Like, he's basically said we want to have two campaigns for this, for this, this organization. So one of them, this is our inner, inner campaign, and that's for Germany's spiritual growth. And the outer one, which is real, we really care for, which was overthrowing the people state of Bavaria. So Soviet Union, post-World War I, has come into Bavaria. They have, there's a very... Uh, Eisner and Bavarians have taken over this part of that. So they want to throw them out. So basically they're having all of this occult stuff be sort of the cover for all their political stuff they're trying to do. Right. So they're like, we're just a magical right. secret society, but also we're overthrowing governments. So the inner campaigns topics, uh, so the ones that were for like the spiritual growth, those would be things like Nordic culture, the esoteric implications of heraldry and the racial significance of genealogy. Proposals to replace Germany's laws with the imagined laws of ancient Northern Europe. Like they just imagine these laws that like were like the better laws that existed before, and they're like, we're just gonna make these up, and these are gonna be our new laws, right? Uh, one of the Law Rings members was a young student named Hans Frank, who later would become a governor general in Nazi occupied Poland, where he did horrible things and was later hanged at Nuremberg. So they start, go they keep going, and so they're trying to overthrow the Bavarian Revolution. And in 19, April 1919, they were accused of attempting a coup, and seven of their members were taken into custody and executed. One of them was their founder, one of the founders, Walter Nauhaus, but also a bunch of aristocrats who were part of this group. There was a countess, there was a prince. The order ends up blaming Sebottendorf for losing their membership, and he didn't attend any more meetings until 1919. And so during this time, there are various members of the Deutsche Arbeite Partei, which is DAP, which would later become the Nazi party. Hitler was a part of the DAP, and there was members of the DAP, DAP or whatever, that were part of the Thule. Hitler was never part of the Thule. That gets like brought up, like people say that, but that's not really true. And there were members of the Nazi parties that were part of the Thule, but not all, not all members of the Thule were members of the Nazi party. If that makes sense. So, uh, right. so basically the society falls in decline and is dissolved, right? About 1924. But 1933, Sabatendorf wants to revive them. At this point, the Nazi party has taken over, the National Socialist Party has taken over in Germany. And he tries to revive the Thule Society in Munich. He publishes a book called Bevor Hitler Kam, Before Hitler Came, and he dedicates it to the seven Thule members who were killed. And he basically says in this that the Thule Society was the most imp important precursor to National Socialism. And he's like, we're the reason that they're Nazis. And Hitler and his friends were like, no, you're not. But, so even though, like, people were, like, the... Nazi socialists at the time were like, this is not, this is, did not influence us. And there were other occult things that go into this. This was exaggerated by Sabatendorf in order to raise, try and basically get the Thule Society back, right? And try to get his like status right. placed back in. Um, but even though it was made up, a lot of early writers, when they were trying to bridge this idea between the Nazis and the occult, used that as reasoning for why 
Hitler was an occult magician and why there were Nazi magicians. And, but it wasn't true. A lot of it was made up. However, it's not to say like there wasn't like any sort of esoteric influence on the Nazi socialism. Obviously, the swastika comes from that. But they end up like banning all Masonic lodges. They try and, you know, distance themselves from that. But I think there's a lot of one. I mean, the idea like it's Nazis are the things you're allowed to hate. And that's really great. Right. But Nazi magicians, like, just became cool in comic books for some reason. Like, I think also Raiders of the Lost mm. Art probably has a lot to do with it. There's a lot of pop culture reasons for this. Yeah. And I think there's, and I've seen this here before, too, that if we can impose sort of, like, the devil made me do it type of things, right? If we can impose, like, real, you know, occultism and magic onto the ideas of something so tragic and so awful, like, it made, like, I don't say like re- make make there be a reason for it, but somehow like that makes it be more sensical for some people, right? Um, but at the same time, I also think it kind of makes them seem cooler. And I don't want Nazis to seem cool. I want Nazis to see. Yeah, like, I don't think, but, but most people don't think of things like that. I That's know, cool. but I don't want to glorify them at all, right? I want them to be boring, yeah. fucking nasty people. What they did, like in this actual town, that this is like this. This is why, like, I made that point earlier. Like, what they did in this town is far more horrific than if they'd actually been Nazi necromancers, right? Like, the reality right. of the situation of what happened in Belarus. I think it was like the t- tens of thousands of people who were murdered in the ghettos of that place is way more terrifying than the idea that some Nazi tried to raise the dead, right? Like that's what's horrifying right. about it. And and I think like after it's like it just made me sad. Like there's no cool research in this. It was just me being like, God, you're a bunch of horrible, stupid fucking people who were bored wanting to make names of yourselves, wanting to push the political regime. You didn't even do put other people down and just picked a group and Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So I don't know. Fuck you, fuck you Nazi magicians. I said I mean, fuck Nazi magicians, I think is just the the theme for this. So and that's kinda it and yeah, so Thule Society, not cool. I'm a poet. Yeah. All right. So back to the end of our episode and we come back and our poor golem is just left there. Yeah. So our, everybody, all the the Nazis are dead. Our poor golem has been deactivated still. Um, Aaron and, and, and Sam and Dean are there. And um, anyways, and, and Aaron basically is sharing with them. He's like, you know, I, now I know the Thul are still out there. So I unrolls the scroll writes his name and he said he knows that his grandfather left him something important that only he can do and he puts it in the golem's mouth to reactivate it and it says looks like i'm the judah initiative now and i would like this spinoff a boy and his golem that'd be good he's so cute that'd be a good one aaron's attractive i'd watch it (laughs) yeah so now I, I call now I call the men of letters bunker. I call it HQ. I'm like, all right, they're back at HQ. So <laughs> Sam and Dean go back to headquarters and Sam is still cataloging stuff. From the know, Sam is well. making a brand new card for the card catalog for the new thing that they got. That's what's like, you don't understand the library nerd of this. All right. So there's this big card catalog that has all these things and he has a new book and he's brought a new book in and he's cataloging it. It is hot librarian nerd shit. I don't know if he's doing like a mark tag, like where he's coming up with his syntax or his taxonomy for like, ah. Oh. Okay, go on. Let's go. I'm going to go to a happy place now. Dean asks Sam if, Dean's asking Sam if he's a man of letters now. And, um, and they have been pouring them drinks while uh, Frankie Lane's on the sunny side of the street plays. And it ends with the two of them drinking. And yes, they are men in letters now. But you can still use a fucking coaster on that table. Please put a coaster on that table. Oh my god, you're leaving a ring spot on that and I will never get that out. Did you see this table? Okay, I guess that's, that's the conclusion this was up to us. Do you have any any notes for us on, on the popular actors of this of this show? I do. Casting couch is the casting couch were they on that show that time with that guy? La 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 la. Yes. 
So here we go. I'll start off with our Rabbi Isaac Bass is played by Hal Linden, most famously known as Barney Miller. Yeah, that's fucking he Barney Miller. Captain, <laughs> Captain Barney Miller from 1974 through 1982. So well known, a long running act, actor in American television. He's also Icon. been on, yeah, he's also been on television shows, episodes um like you know uh, single episodes of shows like car 59 where are you the mary tyler moore show golden girls the nanny gilmore girls mindy project and gray's anatomy and i did a big spread on purpose just to show eras and, and styles and stuff so um he was also uh andrew in the love boat the tv movie in 1976 and mr greenwald in the 2023 movie you people once again big spread for his acting career Aaron Bass was played by Adam Rose, um, which it looks like we will see him again. Um, and he has been in episodes of, sh of shows like The Sopranos, Malcolm in the Middle, Bones, My Name is Earl, Weeds, uh, I Zombie, Santa Clarita Diet, and Modern Family. Um, he also uh, was Makeout Dave in the George Clooney movie <laughs> Up in the Air and um, was in a reoccurring character named Max in the Veronica Mars series. <clears throat> Our golem was played by John DeSantis, who we have seen before and might see one what? more time in Supernatural, <laughs> not as golem, obviously. He was Moloch, Scarecrow, and now the Golem, and then we'll see him again. Um, but in he's got a, a some a, he's done some stunt work, but honestly, most of his stuff is acting. He was Ragnar in the Thirteenth Warrior. Uh, he was Lurch in the '90s series, The New Adams Family. Um, he was Juggernaut in Thirteen Ghosts. Um, he's um, uh, episodes of shows like smallville once upon a time hell on wheels x files supergirl and arrow uh reoccurring character named guster in van helsing the bald man which was a major character in series of unfortunate events which i loved <laughs> um and he in the new peter pan and wendy disney film he is bill eckert was the name of our commandant or commander that was played by bernard forcher and uh, he is, uh, he was um, a Stubunfer Mueller in Fury and a few episodes of Grimm. Torvald was our blonde Nazi. Uh, that was played by Oliver Rice. Um, he's been in episodes of shows like Once Upon a Time, Magicians, Legends of Tomorrow, oddly enough, also as a Nazi, um, The Flash. He's very blonde. Uh, uh, he was in um, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina a couple of times, Nancy Drew a couple of times, and Riverdale a few times as well. Uh, he was Simon in the movie, all, uh, the uh, I think it's Netflix, the Always Me by Always Be My Maybe, and uh, is a reoccurring character in the uh, series Chesapeake Shores. Oh, here we go. Very good. So, what do you think? I actually, I like, I really enjoyed it because I thought it was kind of interesting having like the side story um, tie in because not only are we tying in the men of letters uh, to other current current events, arguably. I mean, I know it dies back, it all ties back to World War II, but this is happening in the now. And then you've additionally got a new creature in the golem and how they handle that. And I think that they had a little bit of a dilemma about it. And it's kind of odd that they were willing to leave it living. Not, not say they shouldn't have, we like our golem, but that they were willing to leave it living or whatever, activated or whatever, because Aaron took control of it. And then that they're kind of settling into this men of letters life. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a thing representing a new era and I think, and now we're finding it to see, if, you know, you can clearly tell this is a happy place and exactly where I want to live. Like, it's just, I can I just have a, like a bunk? Are we haven't even gotten to the bus. Like, you know, there's me more like, you're just like getting your first taste of the bunker. And yeah, I mean, can, can I live in a place filled with a supernatural mother load. Yes, please. Oh, no, anyways. All right. Yeah. And so things we learned today, uh, Golems are cool. Nazi magicians are boring. 
Anything else? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's it. That kind of talk about it. Yeah. All right. So I guess we'll see you next time. Cheers, Drew. Cheers, bitch. Devil's Trap Podcast is a Don't Get It production. Meow. <laughs> Devil's Trap Podcast is part of the Ship It Studios Podcast Network. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Devil's Trap Podcast, Twitter at Devil's Trap Pod, or you can email us at Devil's Trap at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave reviews, and share with all your friends. We're at all your favorite podcast outlets and at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. I'm Babe. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.